Get us to leave at 20 past. Um, well, that's what, okay, we've got 20 minutes. What I'm suggesting is that we have 10 minutes of questions mm -hmm. and 7 minutes of you citing books and 3 minutes of thinking, where the hell did I leave my bag? No, it's alright, my bag's there. Okay, yeah. we've got 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, we've got cool. <laughs> um, questions to, to Kate? It's alright, you're allowed to sit there and look stunned, I'm used to this. <laughs> What's happening in Kali now? Oh, well, they cleared the jungle. There's still people living in um, woods and sleeping rough. And there's still... The, um, the, the warehouse is still there. Like, they own the warehouse. I think Lush bought the warehouse. Thanks, Lush. So, um, I don't think I was meant to know that, actually. Anyway, um, <laughs> to go and buy some Lush products. Anyway. No, <laughs> so um, so the warehouse is still there. They're still sorting through donations. There is a limit to how useful donations actually are. I mean, realistically, the donations are kind of needed further afield, really, than Calais. They're still um, so the camp at Dunkirk got um, got built in a much better place by the mayor of Dunkirk really pushed for an adequate proper refugee camp so there's one that's sort of part run by Medicine Sun. no I don't think it is Medicine Sun Frontier anyway there's, a, there's an NGO running an actual refugee camp in Dunkirk partly for and behalf on, of the Kurdish Mafia who are the only people who can actually get you across the channel <coughs> um, and then there's people sleeping rough in Calais they still want um, volunteers to go over particularly in the summer because a lot of the people who have been involved in the logistical relief effort also do the festivals in the UK so they have a bit of a of a so definitely see if you can be helpful there but there's also the situation in Greece that vast numbers of people are trapped in Greece and then there's kind of a pinch point happening in Serbia because that's not in the EU there's a lot of people in Serbia so we're trying to set up a uh, community centre in Belgrade and then they're coming up to the Hungarian border and what I've heard that is happening on the Hungarian border is any fascist with a gun and a dog is being employed by the Hungarian government who is <laughs> pretty near a fascist themselves and they're murdering and torturing people and sending them back to Belgrade to say this is what happened to your friends don't try and cross the Hungarian border so it's not good mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean me standing there with some dirty baby bottles in Dunkirk is so not the whole of it at all. <laughs> I mean, what I did with this book was I just simply talked about what happened when I was there, the things I actually directly saw. And it was partly in an effort, like, I'd come back and people would say, what was it like? And I was just be like this. <laughs> I don't know how to say what it was like. But by creating a really detailed graphic novel, I can totally go into feeling like you were there sort of thing but it's it's not the whole story <laughs> Tom what happened with the convoy from Nottingham I forgot what happened we weren't allowed to board the ferry oh, was that um, going down all on, on maps yeah Ooh. so we yeah. left Calais the British police stopped us even before we could get to the French passport checkpoints which are actually on you know, this side of the channel yeah um yeah, yeah, there were hundreds of cars, yeah. huge amounts of material aid. Because that's what the police service is for, isn't it? That's why we pay their taxes and wages. We're, Just we're, make sure cult refugee babies can sleep in ditches. Where's all this stuff now? Well, it did. There were arrangements, and it was loaded onto lorries and taken. But I mean, one of the. I don't think anybody was objecting to material aid being taken. What they were objecting to is the presence of witnesses, I guess, on, mm. on mass um, going to the camp, because I think it was fairly, I've forgotten the exact dates, but I think it was fairly close to the point where they were planning to bulldoze and clear the, the site, and I think that was one of the purposes of, of taking the convoy across, but it mm. felt very much that it was not necessarily, it wasn't necessarily a denial of aid, because the aid eventually got through, but they didn't want a bunch of do-gooders you know, white middle class people like me and you I don't going think across and witnessing what was happening there. <laughs> well, witnessing is useful whoever's doing the witnessing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you heard of a book called Arrival City by Doug Saunders? No, it's a book called graphic novel. Uh, 
No, it's a, it's a book on all the whole migration of people and refugees and, and, and everything, you know, for whatever cause. And it turns completely on its head the idea of uh, refugees and immigrants being a burden. It Migrant says, City? Uh, it's called Arrival City. Arrival. Doug Saunders, who I think is a Canadian sociologist. I, I read it by chance. I don't know. If, did I get it from here? I can't remember. I can't remember. Right. It was a long time ago. But I'm, half, I'm halfway through something called Refugee um, Migrant Smuggler Saviour, which is quite an interesting analysis of... Um, the actual financial mechanisms by which pe yeah. people smuggling occurs in different countries. Including All right. Now, this just turns the whole idea of burden into resource. Mm. As it's, it's saying uh, refugees and immigrants are resource, which I think you alluded to in, yeah. in your, your book. And I found it absolutely, I was, I was blown out by it because you keep on hearing on the news about mm. the problems and the, and the burden that they create in various mm. countries you know, particularly in Hungary, places like that. But he shows how, well, there's one place, he talk, talks about one place in um, New Mexico, I think, where uh, illegal immigrants arrived uh, in a town, small town, and built up shops and everything. And they, they were cleared out. And the town found out that it was really very detrimental to trade. <laughs> because they figured about a whole market there and, and a whole creation of, of, of a, you know, small time industry. What? So they invited them all back. What was interesting about Calais is that essentially that refugee camp was built but out of the local bricolage DIY shops. Yes, it did really right, yeah, bloody yeah. well out of it. Yeah, Apparently when Medicine Sans Frontier turns up in towns, then like it, in, I've heard this, this might be a massive slur on Medicine Sans Frontier, but when they turn up, and admittedly it's frontline stuff, but generally when the big NGOs arrive, then all the restaurants yeah. do quite well. Yes. That didn't happen in Calais, but like the right, yeah. Lidl and the fish and chip bars and... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and the DIY yeah. shops, they did really well. They <laughs> were in there all the time. Yeah, the things are all hangs together. That's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's a thing. It's a resource. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Lisa Smith. I'm from the Revolutionary Communist Group. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important that you talked about kind of the role capitalism is playing in all this and obviously the role the British state kind of plays on a global s scale and, and so on. And, um, you know, for example, I just kind of think it's important to highlight some of the things the British state does in Britain um, against refugees, for yeah, example, you know, to yeah. raise hostile environment and the 2014-2016 Immigration Act, which is kind of yeah, and that's legislation really... behind that. Because what that concretely does is sort of turns Everyone. ordinary working class people into border guards, effectively. So like your GPs, your, your, your landlords, teachers, your landlords and so on. Have uh, in, to, if you lose uh, your immigration is questionable, they take away your driving license. Yeah, they, it's yeah. deliberately designed to make people homeless. Absolutely. If they don't apply for refugee status yeah. within a time frame, then they're denied it for life, even yeah. though they like they need help Absolutely. and they should be entitled to it. But if they don't apply past a cut off date, yeah. it's really, really yeah. bad. I'm working right. with Bristol Refugee Voices Project to try and talk about the state of uh, uh, the refugee and asylum seeker mm. situation in this country. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Yeah. So I suppose, yeah, kind of the reason I brought it up is because, like, I think that's an area that's quite in, quite an easy way that people can, like, resist these racist immigration laws. So, like, yeah. you know, it wouldn't take much. For example, the BMA have said they're opposed to, like, these immigration checks in yeah, the hospitals school. and doctors. Like, so, you know, they're getting admin staff to spend resources and time. They don't want to be doing it. I mean, I've got kids. Status. I've got kids in school, and, and school status, you're meant to yeah, be able to yeah. meant to have to write down your kids' immigration yeah. status at the point you apply for school. And mm. my te my school has refused to implement that, mm. and that's partly from the teachers' initiative, but also you know pressure from parents, yeah. something that makes that happen. Yeah, no, it's really important because that's a, a that's a really good point of activism and actively resisting deportation mm. as well and protecting yes, people yeah. from deportation. So. I think there's a lot of stuff that we can do within this country yeah. to to real really good direct action. Thank you so much for yeah. bringing yeah. it around to that. I could probably, t I've got pictures. I'm doing portraits with the Voices Project, but then part of the problem is the portraits are quite good, so then I have to go over them with lace and obscure mm. them for people who are off the radar. But I'm doing that as a an ongoing project now, so I should, could maybe incorporate that into the end of my talk and then talk about that because like. Obviously, that was only like an hour, and I could yeah. make it an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not tonight, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> in it. Yeah. So we.
call, call it a day. And, uh, yeah, I'll just uh, write my name Kate's, in the front of going to be around for, for 10 minutes. Uh, we'll leave that up on screen if anybody wants to take oh, down yes, the, the details of, of uh, the phone project. Yes. Uh, maybe we'll put it on our newsletter or something. Oh, so that would be great. Um, for people. Yeah, no, they right here. And uh, I think that's it. The, the books tonight are they're usually, I think, 16 99 They're £15 pound tonight. Uh, should you wish, and Kate will happily sign them. Thanks very much. I'm sorry it's been so so rushed, and it was so scary. Thank you to the technician at the back there. That <laughs> saved us. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Oh, and if anybody wants to um, get refill, uh, help help yourself to wine from the the back. Wine. From the back?